Everybody can hear me? Yeah, great. Anyone in the back, if you can't hear me? That's weird, because I can hear me and it's really loud. Um, my name's Mike Hegesfeld. Hopefully I won't break this mic. Uh, the name of my presentation here is Yes And. I'm really thrilled to see this many people here. Uh, since they agreed to my request to put me up against VS 2015 the day, against, the day after build. Um, so if any of you wanted to be there, I'm sure that there probably aren't seats and that's why you're here. But thank you for coming. I hope it will be worth our while. The only grunt will be from me, but I think it'll be fun anyway. Um, before I get started, there's a few rules that I've stolen from my old improv troupe, Something Data. First rule is, I'm going to be coming to you guys for interaction. I need you guys to be involved. I may ask for volunteers. I may ask for suggestions, you guys to shout something out. Please do so. Otherwise, we all just sit here and look at each other uncomfortably. The one key thing on that is ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, I want questions right then. Don't wait till the end. It doesn't get any more exciting. So please feel free to interrupt me with questions. But that does take me to my second point. If I don't ask for something, please don't just shout out random things. I, are those like clay lights? Like Paul, clay? Anyway, I'm easily distracted. So if you shout things out, I'm not going to be able to maintain my concentration. Uh, the one exception to that is if you are sitting there with your hand up and I seem to be ignoring you, it just means I didn't see you, feel free to say, hey, Mike, over here, um, because I hate being that guy who's sitting there for seven slides with his hand in the air. And then I forget what I was going to ask anyway. Uh, third rule, please make sure after lunch all your cell phones, et cetera, are on vibrate or silent. I've been known to answer calls during a presentation and have uncomfortable conversations with bosses. So please, if you could do that, that'd be great. Uh, and the fourth rule is have fun and learn something. That's why we're here. I think it'll be a good time and I uh, hope you enjoy it. So to get started, I am an inside the box thinker. I'm a developer, it's what I do. So I went and looked, how do you make a presentation? Googled that up and they said, start with a joke. People love jokes. So I said, I can do a joke. How many developers does it take to change a light bulb? Answer is none. Because that would mean asking somebody where the light bulbs are, and people are kind of scary, and I can just work in the dark anyway. So, that's a hardware <laughs> exactly, it's a hardware problem. The, the thing is that there are a lot of stereotypes about developers. Developers are loners, developers just put their hood up, they put their headphones on, they plug into their computer, at the end of the day, they unplug and they go home. And that's it. They don't like to talk to humans and things like that. We all know these people. Maybe some of you are these people, in which case, I'm so glad you're here. If you're not these people, it's a huge help to your career. If you can be the person who not only codes the hell out of things, but can also talk to clients, not embarrass yourself, actually work with coworkers to make a project go smoothly, that's going to help you. People are going to remember that, and you are going to go far. At least that's the plan. So. Moving on, back into my box. The second part of the suggestion I found on Google was answer the big questions, answer the journalism questions. Who, what, why, when, where, how? So, who? Who the hell am I and why should you care? Um, my name is Mike Hagesfeld. That's my Twitter handle. You can uh, look me up. It's currently live tweeting. I have a program to say brilliant things about this presentation. Um, I've been at Aztec, I've been a .NET full stack developer for 14 years. My first project was in Access, I'm kind of a dino corn, both rare and old. I did my training in improv at Second City. Second City used to have a Cleveland uh, training center, so I took classes there. And then I went on to perform with Something Data Improvisational Theater in Cleveland, which is still going strong after 20 years. If you're ever up in Cleveland, I strongly suggest you check them out. So what is improv comedy? How many people know what improvisational comedy is? Are familiar with it somewhat? A lot of you, fantastic. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the general idea is it is completely unscripted, based largely on audience suggestions. Our motto at Something Data is never the same show twice. We may have very loose structures, but they are going to be informed by whatever suggestions we get from you. So we might say, hey, what did you want to be when you grew up? And you would say, Fireman, all right, one of you had goals. Um, so 
then we would build a scene around a fireman. We could do it the same scene the next day, and maybe it's astronaut. But the whole idea is it's completely made up on the spot. Um, anybody seen Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yes, one of my favorite shows, absolutely love it. It is completely unscripted. I've had people say, oh, they have to know what they're gonna say. One thing, they're incredibly talented. For another thing, they edit. If you give me an hour and a half, I'll get half an hour of good material, I promise. Uh, the Second City, if anybody's been to the headquarters in Chicago, some of their other theaters, uh, they are sort of the, the mothership of improv. A lot of the key ideas were refined there. Uh, they would use improv to build their written scenes. They would improv a bunch of stuff, whatever landed, then they would take that, refine it, write it, and put it into their show. And you may have heard of another show that came out of that, Saturday Night Live. Many of the performers, past and present on Saturday Night Live, came out of Second City, came from an improv background. Uh, while you're in Columbus, unfortunately, none of these guys are performing tonight. But uh, if you're from around here or coming back, uh, be sure to check them out. Columbus Unscripted, Full Frontal Nudity, so named not for what they're wearing, but because being on stage without a script is like being completely nude on stage in a different way than usual. Uh, hashtag comedy, no, not Jimmy Fallon's. They were actually doing it before him. And Improv Wars Columbus. They're all very exciting. Do check them out if you ever have a chance. Uh, so why do you care? That's great, my improv funny haha. -ha. That's not why we're here. Well, the thing is that improv equals communication. If I don't get across to you when I'm doing improv what I'm trying to do, it's not going to be funny. It's just going to be a guy waving his arms around on stage. If anybody's seen me perform improv, that's what I do. Um, if I don't get that across to you, why I'm waving my arms on stage, it's not going to be funny. You're not going to laugh. You're going to ask for your money back. The theater is going to close down. So there's a lot of different levels of communication in improv. Improv is first off, get the idea to the audience. Like I said, if I don't get an idea out to you, it's not going to be funny. Therefore, you're not going to laugh, so on and so forth. The theater closes down. But there's no difference there between that and stand-up. That's just one person on stage talking to you, trying to get funny across. So in improv, there's more than one person. So I've got to communicate with my fellow performers. There's got to be other people that I'm communicating with, and they're communicating with me. And by working together, we build a scene that's even funnier than what I could communicate to you by myself. And thus, more hilarity, theater stays open and flourishes. But I'm not funny. That's not me. I hope I am. But if you're not funny, I've got a secret for you. Everything is communication, not just improv. Anytime you do anything, I use the, the basic rules of improv in communication with my coworkers, in communication with clients, in communication with the barista who screwed up my order, all of these things. Anytime you're talking to people, that is communication. So where and when am I going to use this stuff that you're giving me, Mike? Fair enough. Always, constantly, everywhere. Everything is communication. I may have mentioned this one slide ago. It's absolutely critical to become a good communicator. Unless you're planning to work for yourself, by yourself, in a cabin in the woods with no connection to anything and not sell anything, you will need communication. There is somebody with whom you're going to need to communicate. And so therefore, we need to build on that. I've, geared this towards developers and career development because that's why we're here. But the truth is you can use it for anything, any sort of communication, interpersonal communication, communication with your family, communication with anybody. All right, you win, Mike. But how? How am I going to use this? There's the rub. <laughs> that's the difficult part. We know what improv is. We know that improv is communication. But how do we apply that? Now, I did some math. And it turns out that if improv is communication, then the rules of improv are therefore the rules of communication. I read that in a math book, more or less. Now, once we've boiled down the essence of improv, taken out the funny, again, we get back to, I'm communicating. We are communicating. Everybody's communicating. So if we can use these rules to make better communication, they make funny communication better, but they also make straightforward, everyday communication better. So the rules, not these rules. While communicating will help you find a partner, it is not these rules that we're going to be talking about. 
Starting with yes. The first half of yes and is yes. Does anybody here not like to be agreed with? Right, I thought so. It's always a good thing to have somebody agree with you. It says, you're on my team. You see where I'm coming from. You're my friend. If we start a communication agreeing with somebody, then we start off on the right foot. Like if I start a scene, so I've got firefighter, so I'm like, wow, this is a huge blaze. And my partner comes out and says, doesn't seem that hot. Okay, you know, we completely killed it. All of a sudden, the communication is done between us and therefore with the audience. It's just gone. If you start with a yes, then all of a sudden, it is a huge place. Come on, let's keep going. You know, we're going to build a scene. Something's going to get fun and exciting. So start in your yes space. Come in to a communication feeling positive, trying to find a yes that you can share. Every communication, every communication has a shared goal. Now, sometimes the communication's shared goal is, let's get the hell out of here. Let's get this over with. You know, but it's still a shared goal, and you're both moving towards it. So if you keep that in mind when you're talking to people, then you will be moving towards success. No matter how seemingly conflicting the goals are, you can boil it down and find a common goal. For example, buying a car. Anybody here bought a car recently? Was it fun? Did you have a good time? No? Okay, well, buying a car seems like it about the most conflicting communication you could have. I mean, you have a buyer. The buyer wants to buy the right car. I want these options. I'm sure as hell not going to pay too much, right? I'm going to pay the least amount possible because this guy's out to get me. I want these options. I may have to talk to my spouse. I need to, you know, have a whole network of people I'm going to communicate with. These are the things that I want to get. Now, the dealer, they just want to sell a darn car. They want to move the car off the lot. They've got however many cars on their lot. They want to sell those cars. They don't want to sell somebody else's car. They don't want to send you up to Streetsboro to get a car. They want you to buy their car. Maybe the manufacturer's saying, hey, you need to move Cherokees. So they're going to try and push Cherokees. You know, they've got their instructions. And they sure want to make a big commission, right? They want that price to be as high as possible so their check is as big as possible. They may have a personal goal that they've got to meet, something like that. And they want to get it done. They want to finish. They don't want you talking to somebody else. They want your signature. They want your butt in the car. They want you out the door so they can move on. They don't want to spend their whole day with you. So this sounds like a big conflict, right? These aren't necessarily mutually compatible goals, but they both want a sale to get done. Did anybody here go out this weekend to shop for a car just because it's fun. Anybody go out just like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go shop for cars. That'd be a good time. I don't need one. I'm just going to look around. No, you need to buy a car. That's why you're going to shop for cars. And the dealer wants to sell a car. So you both do have a shared goal. And if you can move towards that by yesing, by anding, that's how you can succeed. That brings us to the and, second half of yes and. Don't just be a yes person. Yes man, yes woman, yes sir, right? Nobody likes a kiss ass. The fact is that if somebody is just agreeing with you and not bringing anything else to the table, it's actually worse than somebody who just disagrees with you. Because at least somebody who disagrees with you makes you question what you're thinking, makes you question what you're saying. At least then you have to defend what you're saying. But if somebody just yeses you, again, man, this is a heck of a blaze. Yep. Okay, I guess I'll carry the scene all by myself. You know, it's like you need people to work with you to bring more to the table. So add something. How we can do it. Now that I've found by agreeing with you our shared goal, I've boiled down what we're talking about. This is our shared goal. Here's how we can accomplish that. Here's another thing we could do. Well, if we want to do this, we could do that too while we're doing this. Here's some more information. Here's another idea. Here's an example of something similar I've done before. Oh, so this is what we're trying to do? I did that the other day, and that was fantastic, and maybe we can apply a lot of that. Here's a problem, but that's negative. Here's a solution. Don't be a jerk. Don't be like, oh, well, that's not going to work. That's stupid. No. It's like, oh, I don't know if you notice this, but this might happen, but here's what we could do, and keep going towards our yes goal. Keep going towards what we share. 
You need to bring something. When you get into a communication, find that shared goal and then bring something. Now, the best way to bring something is to be prepared. If you've got a meeting, if you know that you're going to be having a talk, if you know something's just going to come up, if you see something on the horizon, be prepared. Read up on it. Get ready. Know who you're talking to. Know what you're communicating about. Know why you're getting together. That way, you see the possible problems. You see what the shared goal is, and you're ready to add more information because you've been prepared. You're not just that guy in the meeting. You know, the person who at the end of the conference call, they say, all right, bye. And you're like, Bob was here? I didn't even know Bob was on this call because Bob didn't add anything. Bob just sat there being creepy. Never negate. This may sound redundant. This may just sound like yes again. But the thing is, negation is worse than not yesing, if that makes any sense. To really just pee on somebody's parade is a terrible thing to do. Like, again, if I'm fighting this fire, man, it's really hot. That building's not even on fire. Wow. Now I have to either argue with you or I have to completely make something up. I remember uh, one time I saw a scene, guy comes to the door, rings the doorbell, right? What's he probably doing? Pizzas, right? So his partner comes, opens the door and says, hey, my manhole covers. But this person instead of saying, no, they're not manhole covers, they're pizzas, dumbass, you know? They, pardon my language, if anybody's offended. Um, they said, oh, gosh, yeah, man. I don't know why we started delivering these, you know, just building on that scene. Instead of negating, they built up from there. Find the good. Any idea, no matter how bad, does come from a good place. People have horrible ideas all the time. We've all heard them. And if we say, no, that's a dumb idea, the person gets defensive, plants their flag, gets into their bunker, and defends the stupid idea till they die. So instead, find the kernel of good. Why do they have this dumb idea? What are they trying to get done? And how can they better hand that? Yes, that good idea. That's the thing. Yes, the good. And then and a different path to get to what they want to do, your shared goal. So, like I said, there's a reason that they brought it. Yes, and that. So, now... Let's play a game called What Are You Doing? I need five volunteers, please. There are cookies. All right, there's one, two, three more, three, four, and five. Come on down. Yes, please give it up for these brave people. They had no idea they were going to have to come up and actually be up in front of people. That's my job. I'm contracting. All right. What's your name? Benjamin. Benjamin. Everybody say hi, Ben. Do you mind, Ben? I'm sorry. You said Benjamin. Okay. What's your name? Ray. Ray? You are? Cassandra. Cassandra? Medden. Medden? Yes. Everybody, hi, Medden. Hi. And? Andre. Andre. Hi. All right. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much for coming down. Now, we're going to play What Are You Doing? The way it's going to start, I will start, and then we'll start with you. I'm going to start doing something. Uh, what's something fun that you like to do on vacation? Swim. swim. All right, so I'll be swimming, right? And then, Adam, you're going to come out, and you're going to say, what are you doing? doing? And I'm going to say something completely unrelated to what I'm obviously doing. I'm eating ice cream. And then you're going to start eating ice cream. All right? And then I'll fade out, and then you're going to go out. So you're eating ice cream. Keep eating ice cream. And you're going to come out and you're going to say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Eating ice cream. No. Nope. <laughs> Makes sense, huh? You're yesing her. I understand that completely. <laughs> but you're going to name something else. And instead of negating you, you're going to say, you're going to be eating ice cream, but you're going to say you're climbing a mountain or something. What are you doing? Playing basketball. Playing basketball. So now instead of saying, no, you're not, you're eating ice cream. She's going to start playing basketball. <laughs> there you go. Great. Go ahead. <laughs> Excellent. What are you doing? I am building a skyscraper. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, brick by brick. What are you doing? I'm uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, corral my cattle. 
<laughs> Corral cattle. Come on, cowboy. You got it. Yes, and. <laughs> Woo-haw! All right, everybody. Let's put it together for our brave volunteers. And like I said, there are cookies. There you go. Have a cookie. I'll take cookies from strangers. There you go. Believe me, I know a lot of actors and a lot of developers. Free food was key. There you go. Can we come back for another cookie? For another cookie? Oh, we'll see. There may be other opportunities. Uh, now everybody wants to volunteer. Oh, I would have done that. So anyway, the key is, if somebody had come out and said, I'm not eating ice, you're not eating ice cream, it's like, yes, I am. And if anybody here has kids, yes, I am. No, you're not. Yeah, I am. No, you're not. Right? It's about the worst thing you can hear besides whining. And if they whine and do that, but I'm getting off track. Point is, don't negate. Find the yes and go for it. Going back to buying a car. I'm sorry. So we'll take this hypothetical buyer. Let's say he's a dad, he's married, he's got three kids. I don't know anybody like this at all. Um, so he comes in, he wants a red SUV. That's what he's decided on, he's looked around, he's priced it out online. He wants it with that cool DVD player in the back to shut the kids up. Not that we would want to shut the kids up. Um, I mean, he wants for educational videos. And um, he's not going to pay a dollar more than $40,000. He's priced it out. That's how much he's going to pay. He's ready for it. But, of course, his wife wants in on the final decision because it's a huge decision. It's $40,000. She wants in on it. So he's going to go out, he's going to shop, and then he's going to go back. He's going to talk to her before he makes any decisions. So here's the dealer. Now, this was yesterday. It is April 30th. If he doesn't make a sale today, he's in big trouble. He's not going to meet his quota. He needs to make that sale today. He doesn't want this sale going on his May quota. He sold his last SUV yesterday. He was pretty psyched. It was another sale towards his quota. But he has no more SUVs on the lot. None. And he gets an additional bonus if he closes the deal today. He's got, in addition to meeting his quota, he's going to get an extra bonus if he can close the deal today. So the buyer comes in. He says, I'm looking for a red SUV. He's ready to fight, right? He is putting my flag down. I want a red SUV and I'm here. And the dealer says, we don't have any. You're going to have to go somewhere else. No, of course he doesn't say that. He wants to make a sale. He knows that that man's in there to buy a car. So he says, I can totally see that you would need a large car like an SUV. And while we don't have any currently on the lot, if you take a look at a minivan, I, I, I see that look on your face. I know. Never drive a minivan. Minivans are for old people. You know, just try it. They've done a lot of work with both the design and the drive in minivans. They have these huge engines now. I mean, they can pff, take off. Just try it. Because right now, we're actually, we've got a special on minivans. Not only do you get the DVD players for the kids, keep them entertained, you also get the rear view camera so you don't accidentally run them over. It's, I can get you all of that. I can get you in that car for 37000 and it's fire engine red. I can do all of that for you. Now the guy's listening. He, he said, oh, you need a big car. You think you want an SUV, but here's another solution to solving your yes. So the guy takes it, he goes out, drives his red minivan, gets on 270, it shoots up the ramp. He's like, all right, now we're talking. I'm going to take this home. I'm going to talk to my wife about it. I'll be back in tomorrow. You know, I think it sounds good, but uh, I'll bring her out so she can drive it and we'll see what's going on. And the dealer in his head's like, no, 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 don't go. <laughs> right? He's not going to be like, don't bother coming back tomorrow. I'm going to get fired. You know, just go, just leave. No, he says, of course, this is a huge decision. I totally understand why you would need to talk to your wife. I'll be honest with you. I have to make a sale tonight. It is April 30th. Everything you've heard about quotas. If you've ever listened to the This American Life podcast called 127 Vehicles, if you haven't, go listen to it. It'll make you think about car dealers a totally different way. But anyway, point being, he needs to make the sale. And he admits that. He says, yes, you need to talk to your wife, and I need to make a sale. So... I will give you my office. I will set up Skype. You guys can talk about it face-to-face, -face, really get into it. And if you go tonight, if you buy this car and take it home to her tonight, I will do it for 36 It's money off my check, but I do need to make this sale. I'll be completely honest with you. That's what I need to do, and I can get it to you for 36 So the guy Skypes with his wife, says, you know what, I tested it. I think you'd really like it, and we can get it really cheap today. Done. She says, go for it. If you think it's a good car, Bring it home, does the deal. 
Both sides wanted to get a car sold. And so the car got sold. That's the thing. The dealer, instead of saying no, no, you can't have it for that much. No, you can't have that car. No, go home. He said, yes, I understand where you're coming from. I'm boiling it down to something that we can reach a mutual agreement on, and we're going to move forward and meet our mutual goal. So now that I'm done with my talk to the Car Dealers Association, any car dealers here? Anybody? No. Okay, so it turns out that car selling is not the only place things like this can be useful. I personally a web developer, so a lot of the examples have to do with web development. They are equally applicable to software development, design, really whatever you do. Remember, everything is communication. All right. So this is an example we get approximately every day. Can you make the logo, anyone? Bigger. bigger. Can you make the logo bigger? There's yet to be the client who isn't pretty sure people come to their website to see their logo. Now, I'm not a designer, thank God, but every time this happens, my designer, I know because he comes back to the office and he talks to me about it. This is not about not having negative thoughts. We all have negative thoughts. I'm not going to get up here and Tony Robbins this and just big smiles, everything's great. No, they're a pain in the ass. Um, but they are facts of life that we have to deal with. Why does this person want this huge logo? So in the brain, my designer's saying, no, no, you can't have a bigger logo. I put it there on purpose. This is my job. I don't tell you how to make widgets. But he doesn't say that because then he's no longer a client. He says, yes, you're right. Establishing identity is really key to defining your brand. That is a great logo, and we really do think that your brand is critical here in our website design. And that's why we set the logo off. It's got a lot of white space to actually draw attention to it. Think about it. If you walk into a big white room and you see a tiny green P, you're going to notice that P because it's the only thing. We're going to set it off. We're not going to make it huge. We're going to set it off so that it gets attention. Plus, it gives it the gravitas of subtlety, which is a really fun phrase I thought of a couple days ago. But <laughs> if you think about famous logos, they're not huge. If you go to Amazon.com, it's not like Amazon, oh, and products. No, it's up in the corner. Everybody knows it. It's all over the box, but it's just there. It's not ginormous. So we found what they, why they wanted the logo bigger and then agreed with it and took them in a different direction, which they were willing to do because the first thing we said was yes. Not no, you can't have a big logo. Yes, we understand why you want this. Here's a shared goal, and here's how we can meet it. Now, this is an actual example, but this is not the actual site. Uh, hid the actual site to protect the guilty. Um, but I really like the safety supply site, which is not the site, again, if you recognize it. I just like the fact that they have cool spacesuits. Like, I really came close to buying one of these and playing E.T. at home, if anybody's old enough to remember that movie. Anyway, so our client will say they were running a safety supply site. It was something equally grabbing. And they said, our site is boring. We want a fun box. Literally, they called it a fun box. <laughs> we want a fun box where people can play hangman. <laughs> to which my designer said, sweet Jesus, no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No. He didn't say the client said, yeah, they're going to come back for the fun box. That's why they're going to come to our safety supply site to play, play hangman. So I said, no, you're stupid. Nobody plays hangman. If they did, they'd go to hangman.com and play hangman. But we didn't say that because, again, we like clients and money. So we said, yeah. People do waste a lot of time on the Internet, right? They play a lot of games. Anybody here ever been on the Facebook once or twice, maybe at work even, right? When you're supposed to be shopping for safety supplies. People do waste time distracting themselves from what they're supposed to be doing. And your product selection is pretty dry. In addition to awesome space suits, they also sold, you know, hair nets and, and rubber gloves and things that can be fun in certain contexts, but generally are pretty boring. So they said, you're right. And here's another option. Instead of Hangman, they could have some cleverly titled blog posts. Safety the first time, so it isn't the last time. Slipping and falling in love with safety mats. Things like this, you know, not 
side splitting, but still something to gain somebody's attention, something to get them to click. This has direct relevance to your site. This relates to why they came there. Hangman does not have to do with why they came there. They did not come to play Hangman. They did come to find safety supplies. It's going to draw people's attention, and it's going to drive sales. Maybe that headline grabs their attention. They forgot that they do need safety mats. They do need something else that they hadn't thought about. And you're maximizing their utility. They don't get all this space taken up by Hangman. They don't get sucked into a game of Hangman and forget that they were supposed to buy something in the first place. And then they can go crush candy somewhere else on a site that was built for that. So again, yes, despite the fact that this was an idiotic idea, yes, you're right that there are good ideas here. Let's find out why you want Hangman on your site and find another solution. Details. It's all in them. Sounds really dumb that way, but that's the way PowerPoint puts this together. It is all in the details, as they say, the devil and everything else. One of my favorite improv examples is we were doing a show, actually I think it was rehearsal, and somebody said, okay, amusement park. That was a suggestion we got. So somebody, probably me, went up and was waiting in line for the thing. Somebody said, stop, stop, stop. Try this instead. I came up. So. Right? They had to go all the way through the big labyrinthine thing to get to the thing. That was where the laugh was. Not just in sitting there waiting for it, but by adding that detail, not saying a word, suddenly it was a whole different scene. A lot funnier, a lot more interesting. So last night, not that way you sickos. Um, last night, I had pizza. It was a deep dish pizza with pepperoni and sausage, and it was good. Anybody excited for pizza now? A couple people? Now, whether those people are always excited for pizza, I'm not going to end you. Anyway, last night I had Adriaticos. Anybody here had Adriaticos before? All right, highly recommend it down on 12. It's spectacular pizza. I mean, it has this really thick, rich crust. Like, I'm pretty sure they put butter in it. It's amazing. It's got this spicy sauce, but it's not like that overpowering, like, hey, look how spicy we are sauce. It's just really flavorful sauce and these giant, huge pepperonis that take up the whole slice. And they got that real sausage, you know, with the fennel seeds. You can see them and... It's amazing. Now who wants pizza? Does that sound a little more compelling? Yeah. With details like that, that's how you can get people's attention. If you just tell somebody to do something, they may not listen. If you tell somebody why, if you give them an example, if you give them details, you're much more likely to convince them to do something. Here's another example from work. We want to use a rotator on the home page so we can show everything about our site in one place. Right? Anybody seen these rotators? Anybody else go to sites just to watch the rotators? Right? You sit there, oh, I heard number three is really good. <laughs> OK, you know? Not so much. We don't look at the rotators. So that's what we said. We said, no, don't do it. It's a bad idea. Nobody uses those. So they left and found somebody who would give them a rotator. That's not what happened. We did not say no. We knew no. But we figured out what they actually wanted. I said, yes, Ann. Yes, you're absolutely right. We do need to communicate all of these aspects of your site. You have a lot going on. You have different products. You have offerings. You have contests. These are all very cool things, and we want to make sure people know about them. And we saw a study that Eric Runyon did on nd.edu, Notre Dame's website. It said that 84% of rotator clicks were on the first slide of the rotator. So that means there were 16% left for the other four slides. So that really cool contest you're running that you think is going to drive a lot of people to your site, 4% of people know about it. Percent, oh, well, that doesn't seem so good. So no, but people are using mobile more. And so they're used to scrolling now. This whole idea of above the fold is pretty passe. So maybe we could you know, do some parallax scrolling, put a lot of ideas actually on the home page. And maybe we can build in some more links. Maybe we can make things a little more noticeable. Maybe change the menu a little bit. Make things so that they're going to work better to get people to the things you want to get them to. Here's some other ideas. We see why you want to do it. Here's specific details about why it might not be the best idea. And here's some great other ideas so that you can accomplish what you want because we're on the same team. We're moving towards that same goal. Questions. 
Questions are a good thing. Did anybody hear that noise? Oh, that was every improv teacher ever having their head explode. Because one of the first rules of improv right after yes and is no questions. So Mike, this is supposed to be about the improv rules and how they apply to communication. Why are you telling me questions are good? Well, first let's play a game called questions. I'm gonna show you why they're bad. Can I get two volunteers? More cookies, I swear. All right, there's one right there. Anybody else? Somebody wants a cookie. You want a cookie, come on down. All right, put your hands together. More brave volunteers. See, this is why we got the red shirts on. It's going to our doom. All right, well, while we wait for her, why don't you introduce yourself? What's your name? I'm Steve. Everybody say hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. All right. Angelia. Angelia, everybody say hi, Angelia. All right, so what we're gonna do, Steve, I'll start with you. I'm gonna do a scene, but every line of the scene has to be a question. It does? Yes, it does. Oh, wait, now I lost, I was eliminated. That was a good start, excellent work. So, Angelia, you're in now. So can I get someplace really cool you've been on vacation? Egypt. Egypt, all right, you're in Egypt, anywhere you want in Egypt, questions only. Go ahead. <laughs> and he bows out. All right. You know what? That's cookie worthy. That's cookie worthy. That shows exactly why improv teachers hate questions. Right? Her question had negation built right into it. I hope you're stuffed with a napkin. Jeez. <laughs> Her question had negation. He didn't have anything to do. There was no yes and no and. It was a disaster of a scene. Nothing personal, guys. I mean, I set you up for failure. Um, but the thing is, when you're doing improv, questions are so bad then, Mike. Why are they good? Brian Cranston humor. Gets me every time. Um, the reason is, in improv, you're responsible for the and. When she said, what's a pyramid? He's shut down. Now he's got to explain what a pyramid is, and there's no scene. She was responsible there. Not in this game, you did a great job. But she was responsible for saying, that is an amazing pyramid. And look, the aliens are still working on finishing it. You know, something like that. Bring something else to the table. But it turns out that some people are across the hall watching the VS 2015 presentation, and they're not here. They don't know that they're responsible for bringing the and. They are not sitting there thinking, how can I bring information to the table? They may still be fighting against you, thinking that you're not working towards a mutual will. They may just not know how to do it. They may just not be good communicators and they're not bringing more information to the table. So therefore, you can ask a question that will help them bring the and to the table. Excuse me, should I have a drink? So questions are not inherently bad like meth. Meth is inherently bad, don't do it. Um, questions can be good, but there are bad questions. For example, a question that's just showing off. You know, hey, why don't we try this new technology? I think we should do grunt. Really, why? Because I heard about grunt. <laughs> you know, like, there is lots of good stuff, but don't just say something to show off. Say something because you're actually bringing value. Maybe you have a hidden agenda. Hey, so I noticed you completely forgot to put a semicolon there. You know, like, don't ask a question that's just set up somebody else for failure. Don't bury your negation in a question. You know, there are questions that are yes questions and there are questions that are no questions. Don't try and, and again, it, they can all tie together in their badness. You could be showing off that you know what they did wrong and making them look bad. But you know what that's gonna do with your communication partner? Defensive. You've set it up as a negative communication from right that moment. You're not working towards the and. You're not asking questions designed to bring more information in. So there are good questions, educated questions. Remember we talked about, about being prepared? You're gonna know what's going on. You're gonna have questions maybe already ready. Maybe you noticed that there was something missing and you're gonna ask a positive question to bring out the information to fill that void in your mind. Maybe a new perspective, a question to, to put them in a space that they weren't in when they thought of how they were going to do something. Like if you have a client who says, 
hey, before they buy something, they've got to fill out a form and register as users. Because from their perspective, this is great. I'm going to have all this information on my users. I can gear my marketing towards more specific things and have all this stuff and send them catalogs. And then you say, have you ever been to a site where you like to register before you buy something? I say, I, no. Because nobody likes to register before they have to buy something. Nobody wants to fill out forms unnecessarily. Once you've changed their perspective so that they're in the customer's perspective, suddenly it's a whole different ball game, and they see the information there. You're helping them provide that and, and a customer might not like this, where can we maybe get that information another time? Again, helping get to the and. Helping them provide information, not just showing off for yourself. So some examples of some good questions. Somebody proposes a new feature. How many people here use personas? Am I familiar with the idea of personas? All right, for those of you who don't know, it's when you're putting together an initial project, you're thinking of who's going to be using this, just sort of a, a general crystallization of the person, you know, an example of somebody who is going to use this, like Alfred the accountant is going to use the tax software. So if the client says, you know what, we should build in Pac-Man into our accounting software. Say, who's going to use that? Is that Alfred accountant? Is he going to really play Pac-Man in his accounting software, or does he really just want to do the accounting? And I'll say, yeah, I guess you're right. I just really like Pac-Man. Sorry. You know, like, these are the kind of questions. Again, help them get to that information. Instead of, that's dumb, they're not going to use it, ask them a question and let them bring the end. Would we be able to apply a new technology? If there is a reason to use Grunt, then, and you don't see it, maybe you just don't understand, why are we going to do this? Maybe I'm not familiar with the new technology. I see that you've outlined, you know, talking to a coworker. Oh, I see you said that we should do this. Why, why do you think we should do that? Then they can give you the information, help you understand, or come to the realization, you know, maybe we don't need to do that. Maybe that wouldn't be a great solution. But again, they're bringing the information. You're helping them bring the information of why you should do something instead of just pursuing it blindly. Did you talk to Frank about the time that he built a Pac-Man game? You know, or whatever, you know. If you've got to do something and you know that somebody else had tried this before, ask if they've already talked to that person, you know. Bring that information. You're bringing the end with the question, and then they can either bring the end of, oh, yeah, I did. He said that we should do X, Y, and Z, or really, I didn't even know he did that. That's fantastic. Let's go talk to him. How did you come to this conclusion? Some of these questions may sound an awful lot like they could be good or bad questions, and you're exactly right. How did you come to this conclusion? You're dumb. You know, like, it could totally come off wrong. But if you really just don't see it, if there was a, and then a miracle occurs, step. You know, it's just, oh, I, I, I just don't see how, you know, we went from step three to step four. Then they can explain it to you. Again, they're bringing the and. If you don't understand it, like if you're talking to a coworker about a proposal, if you don't understand how they got there, then the client's probably not going to. And or you end up somewhere where you don't want to be. You know, have any of us ever had a sales person give a proposal that says there will be user management? Right? Something like that where they didn't fill in the details. Again, going back to details. And if somebody had asked a question, maybe then we could have brought the and brought more information to that. So, in summary, yes. Start in your yes space. Start in a positive place for any communication. There is agreement. There is a common goal somewhere. You just need to find it. Sometimes it's really easy, and sometimes it's not. But you need to start with yes. Indicate that you are open for working together, and then the person that you're working with will be open to working with you. Instead of getting into your bunkers, come out and work together. And bring something. This is good for the communication, and it's good for you. Again, we don't remember Creepy Bob at the end of the conference call. We remember the person who added something to the conversation, the person who brought information, the person who asked good questions, the person who was involved but in a productive way. Be prepared. Be ready for communication to happen so that you can bring good information. Do not negate no matter how bad an idea something sounds like, don't negate it. Find the yes. Find something that you can find good in that. Boil it down to the goodness. Yes and that. Move towards the common goal. It may sense that these are connected. There's a reason for that. Details, details, details. 
Eliminate the ambiguity. Give people reasons. I'm not just bringing this and, I'm bringing this and for a reason. I'm bringing this and, and here's what it is. Let me spell it out for you. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. There's a very good reason I'm saying this, and here it is. If you just say, let's do this, why? Give them the why. Give them the and. Ask good questions. Other people aren't here. They're not listening to me right now. Poor saps. But they may not know. Bring the and. Help each other out. Provide more information. So ask good questions. Get more information out of them. Make them think something good was their idea. Everybody will know it's actually your good idea. But if you ask the question and make it sound like theirs, they're going to love you. A lot of times, the best improvisers you ever work with as an improviser aren't necessarily the funniest people, but they sure as hell make you look funny. They're helping you. They're giving you the and that you can make funny out of. Those are the best people that you love to work with. And finally, support local improv and buy presenters beer. They like it. If you see them out somewhere looking sad in a red shirt, like they need a beer, buy them a beer. Very nice people, maybe some Froyo. I've heard they're somewhere around. Anyway, um, so that's my talk. We've still got a few minutes. Uh, did anybody have any questions? Anything? No? All right. Forgot the last rule. There are questions. Um, did anybody have an example, anything from their own work experience or life experience, a communication that maybe didn't go as well as they would have liked that, that we can all hive mind and, and try and find a yes and, something to... You guys are lucky. You guys have these great... Oh, here's one. All right. Right. And so um, what, what I was able to do, I, I started it out, but what I find, found effective was um, they started asking, well, is this as a business user or is it a user of the website? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and as they started to ask these questions, they started to see that, oh, well, maybe I need two stories, one from their point of view and one from mine. And it was, I don't know, I guess like one of those examples of an effective way of saying, like, I'm not going to give you the answer, but if you ask the right question, I can see that you'll figure it out. And then they were like, ah. Right, exactly. Find the good idea. Don't say, you idiots. No, you just fill in the blanks. You can just do this. It's, okay, so what do you, when you're wondering about, is it a business user? Is it, you know, maybe we need two users. And I say, you're right. I'm glad I thought of that. You know, and then, um, you know, again, by yesing them, not by, guys, come on. We just do the thing. We make the card. We put the answers in, you know. But again, yes, and I don't know if anybody heard, he said that people were having trouble understanding the idea of user stories. People aren't familiar with that. This is a pre-planning thing, often in Agile, just as a blank, I need to blank because blank. And so they were having trouble understanding that. They just wanted to sit down and write technical specs. And, um, but by encouraging them to, to keep thinking at it and work on it in different ways, they were able to find that they had two different user stories and one user story, things like that. So thank you. Uh, anybody else? Anything? All right, well, then I will wrap it up. We've got some drinks left over here if anybody wants another drink. If you want to talk to me, I'll be up here uh, unplugging and eating cookies. So um, thank you guys very much for coming out. I appreciate it.